Good morning, we have a very fruitful discussion with our team. I'm sure that we will continue on with that. He has agreed to give us this lecture for the next six hours and all the time. Thank you very much. I request Charles and Isaac to be here.
Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I was telling Ben Cotton last night that uh, I have been planning this trip for five years now. Uh, I had worked 2013-2014. I said, I'm going to make it over to India this year. Anyway, I finally made it, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as my background briefly described, Mike Teller is a Mike not film. I've done a lot. There's a lot of different roles in the work that I've done. I push brooms, I've done design work, I've managed people, I uh, watch companies sell and become bigger companies and been a part of that. But today I'm doing one of my very favorite things, which has always been the real reason I like doing this work. I'm getting to talk about what happens when we build something and we get to see what it can really do. And that's, that's what I like to do. So I'm going to briefly discuss what Seabird is today as a company. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, how we see this era of uh, ocean observation that we are in as a community. I want to talk about the role of some of the new tools that are available to add to the capabilities that we hold. And finally, I want to show a few of these stories that, uh, once again, speak to what these things, new tools can really do. This is Seabird today. We're uh, approximately 200 people. Uh, we have uh, five global locations around the world, two in the United States, one in Canada, one in Kempen, Germany, and one in Beijing, China. We are a science company. We are engaged in the development of oceanographic sensors that we share with the community, that we provide to the community. And this is our role, to enable you to do good science in the oceans. Uh, solutions, you're very familiar with the types of applications we deal with. And I'll talk a little more about some specific applications as we go forward. So, in my mind, we are right now really at the early stages of the second great era of ocean observation. People might have different opinions of this, but my view is that the latter part of the 20th century, the ocean observations were really about validating fundamental physics, optics, some radiative transfer, potential biological information, natural science. It was really this era where we began to build that basic understanding of what the ocean does and validate the principles of ocean physics, chemistry, biology. Um, the second era started, give or take, um, late 90s, early 2000s. And this is the era where we really began to expand our observations and understand the problem of flux, be it heat transfer, and more recently, maybe carbon. So we're really at this time where we're expanding our capabilities, we're coming together, we're putting out larger sets of systems, and now as we capture what the community is, we have hundreds of local, regional, global OOS organization, ocean observing organizations around the world. We are definitely working more and more as a global community and looking at the observations, and comparing our results, and uh, working together to build better systems to look at the interaction of various things going on in the ocean. And we're emerging our capabilities, our capabilities are emerging with autonomous sampling platforms, systems, and the various sensors that go on them. Um, we're actually using the data more and more and closer and closer to real time. So we're starting to understand the processes as they are impacting the world right now. 
and we're making major ongoing investments to expand this. Uh, this picture, it's a picture of the global R of temperature. These are, if you look closely, the various dots represent approximate location of R of flux. This is salinity. It's just one, uh, I think, very iconic uh, example of where we stand in ocean observation today. It's not like we don't have room to improve, however. Um, we do definitely have limitations in our capabilities. We were talking about some of these earlier today. Uh, I think chief among us, or among these, fouling. Fouling remains a severe limitation, especially for autonomous systems such as moorings and buoys. Um, you can figure out power, you can figure out drift and how to compensate natural drift, but fouling is something that still sticks with us. Uh, we still have, in all rare, most cases, fairly limited capacity with the types of measurements we can make. Uh, this is especially true as we move into biology, where things like speciation and classification of different organisms and understanding ecosystems, that's still not something we can do really well. We have problems with platform system reliability, sensor reliability. We have issues with bandwidth and telemetry. As we expand these capabilities, how are we going to manage terabytes of communication from very remote locations? How are we going to do that? It's fine if you have cables, but what about the buoy that's sitting out in the middle of the ocean? And we have problems, which I think is one of the key problems going forward. We have problems with data assimilation. Um, down here at the bottom, I have a workflow diagram we made at Seabird a year ago that sort of captures the various steps from actual collection of the data to here at the other side, really being able to post the data and use it as a finished product. And you go, you're familiar with these various steps. You have to get the data and measure it. You have to capture and transmit the data. You have to ingest the data or upload it, download it to the main systems that you're going to do evaluation. And then comes the data check, QA, QC, initial availability to the users so they can start to build higher order products. On and on it goes. The point is, from our calculations, generally speaking, the time that it, from the time you actually capture that initial data to the time that it's useful in the community, you're often talking two or three years. That's something we've got to address. So here's the state of the future, right? This is the way it's going to be. We're going to have various different types of platforms cruising through the ocean, all networked together, collecting data. Ships will be out there doing simple work, sort of working as the aircraft carriers in modern oceanography. Buoys will be along the coast and in the open ocean. And it's all going to work together as a seamless system. I think that that's a reality that's going to come, frankly. Uh, autonomous data streams will be providing the bulk of our measurements as we go forward. That doesn't mean we're going to quit using ships. Ships will be integral. But most of the data will be coming from the autonomous platforms. Ocean data will be driving assimilation models um, and actually providing near real time output that are dealing with economic and societal needs that are real time. Uh, we're going to be providing extended measurement capabilities between our sort of current state of the art of CT and uh, connectivity temperature data. And the ocean stream data streams themselves are going to become more reliable. We'll have improved onboard QA, QC. We're going to have adaptive intelligent sampling, near real-time synoptic data product. And I think finally, we're going to have data at the density and sampling frequency and richness that is going to be able to not only fulfill model accuracy and help us understand things on a more ongoing basis, help us understand 
where the trains are going. But help us capture those episodic events that aren't necessarily in the models and help us understand what's going on with them. Today, most of what I'm going to be talking about is this part, the extended measurement capabilities beyond the T and S. Um, that said, it's going to be a context of all these things. And it's really around this concept that we are building this future city. So good data, it really makes a difference. And what I mean by good, it's probably a relative concept when it comes right down to it. You know, good depends on what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes there's good enough, and sometimes it has to be really good. But in general principles, uh, good data means you're doing the right measurements or the right proxies. You're measuring with the right accuracy and stability and precision to capture the natural variance of the background. And you're looking at the data in the right temporal and spatial sampling density to make sense of what's really going on in the system that you're trying to measure. One example that just sort of happened, as it were, that shows what good data can do for you. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's an interesting story. Uh, in the United States, there's this community in Florida, Stewart, Florida. It's uh, southern Florida. It's famous for tourists coming and being able to experience the eastern Florida coast, to experience that outdoors, go fishing, be on the beach, enjoy themselves. And uh, summer is oftentimes one of the high tourist seasons there. Well, in the summer of 2015, there was a massive bloom. Um, the bloom, of course, destroyed local fishing. It was been a high holiday season, and nobody was going to the beach. It was the bloom that just it reeked. So people really wanted to be as far away from there as ever. And it made a big stink in the community, quite literally. And it wasn't the first time that it had happened. It tended to happen more and more often. There was a lot of conjecture as to why it was happening. Um, and the only difference in 2015 that, uh, compared to other years was that there were monitoring buoys that were set at different points to the bay. And I'll, I'll actually show this in more detail as we go forward. Onward to the conjecture. The conjecture was that there was a lake upstream of the bay of the estuary that during the summer the state uh, regulators would release discharge from the lake and it would inundate the bay with high phosphate levels and thereby you would have a situation where you create big blooms. Well, the difference in 2015, once again, is the buoys were there to tell what really was going on. It wasn't about the phosphate. What was really going on is, yes, they were doing the discharge, but it, the actual phosphate levels, while higher, weren't that bad. But with the high discharge, they were creating a back pressure into the bay. So waters that were coming in through normal tidal currents weren't able to get into the upper reaches of the bay, and the back part of the bay became stagnant, and that created dynamics. So suddenly we have a situation, this is a actual sea uh, dawn versus phosphate data. The reason it's there is because it gave us a signature of the water from the different types. And with this different signatures, we could tell where the water was coming from. This allowed us to understand what was going on in the system. The state was able to quickly grasp that if they coincide releases of the water with tidal cycles, they can flush, the tide went away, or the harmful algae bloom went away, and things work much better going forward. That's what good data can do. So you understand, but I mean there's a strong familiarity within the community about conductivity, temperature, depth, measurements. These sensors are getting very good. Uh, we're proud of our capabilities with our products. I think other companies are coming out with good products. So what I wanted to talk about today mostly was the 
these other capabilities that we can bring going forward. And this helps us sort of fulfill this picture of what we can do with better talent. And so with the biogeochemical world, what we're really talking about in sort of general terms is the ability to look at carbon, carbon in its different forms. And we have the chlorophyll, it's pigmentation, sort of looking at active biology. We have a particulate dissolved organic carbon, uh, particulate and dissolved organic carbon, looking at uh, remnants of biological activity, looking at both active and dead biological life. We have nutrients and dissolved oxygen, and then we have dissolved inorganic carbon. These are the products that Seabird contributes to the various biochemical measurement capabilities. We provide pH, we provide various nutrient sensors, DO. And so these are the tools that I'll be talking about and showing you different capabilities. I'm going to start by talking about the BGC on clubs. Um, we all are aware of the Argo program. All aware of the capabilities that Argo has provided. And most many of us are aware that there's early efforts, nascent efforts, to get a bio Argo program going where we're expanding the measurement capabilities of the programmable flows to extend to, excuse me, to extend to other parameters such as oxygen, chlorophyll, dissolved uh, organic matter, etc. Um, Seabird has been actively involved in developing these capabilities for GLOBES. We have a variety of different configurations that we offer for doing measurements of BGC in the water column with GLOBES. We have a, a specialized sensor head now that we integrates pH, uh, backscattering, chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, and CTD into one So this is, this is one of the key areas where we've been investing in the last five years. Um, I'm not going to say much about this. The Argo program or the Argo mission deployment often involves a descent rest, um, descent further to 2,000 meters, and then an ascent where we actually capture data. Um, sometimes BGC data programs differ a little bit. We want to perhaps sample more frequently and do a higher uh, intensity at near the surface than at the deep waters. But what we found in our own testing is even in standard Argo mission uh, programming that there's a lot to be seen with BGC information. I'm going to show you two examples of why I think BGC really adds to our picture of what's going on in the ocean uh, with the floats. This data is about 16 months of uh, data from a single float. It's uh, captured offshore near Hawaii in uh, lipotropic waters, high light, low gradients during the year, not a lot of variability uh, over the seasonal changes. Um, with sigma T, you know, full top to bottom gradients on the order of about 20%. Here is dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll from that same flood during that same time. Notice the difference in the variability uh, for the same waters looking at the same mass. You notice that the oxygen varies by almost an order of magnitude. And if you really look at the limits of detection with fluorescence, it's there vary by almost two orders of magnitude. So right away, what we begin to see with biogeochemical measurement is in these areas where we have relatively little change in physical parameters, we start to see a lot of impact in the couple of biological and chemical systems that are going on at the same time. The second example points to the bigger reason we want the biogeochemistry. We're here looking at a flood deployment that we let loose in the Mediterranean Ocean, sort of following the coastline and then coming out here off the Florida and just sort of circling around. 
this was a 16-month deployment, and uh, during this time, we saw a seasonal overturn event. Um, it was a very significant event. It, uh, we put it in late in August, early September, and we had some stratification in the water as that stratification disappeared. Finally, we had this overturn. And we really saw our gradients. If you look here, I'll show you a little better picture in a minute. Really, the gradients in the Sigma T just went to nothing, with really no change at some point during that February time period. Once again, this is oxygen and chlorophyll for that same time. So during the early going, there was uh, reasonable stratification. This cuts in a little later into the year, so we can really watch what's going on. Um, some stratification, and then as that overturn event happens, the stratification disappears and the gradient change disappears. But the thing to note is that it doesn't go to zero or it doesn't disappear at this time. There's uh, physical quantities of chlorophyll and oxygen that are being pushed into the water column. When we, I'm going to need to run a little, let's see if I can get it here. I'm going to have to go over to the. So now we're watching sigma T and oxygen and chlorophyll over that course of time. And we're going to come up, uh, we've got to get to February, so be patient, folks. Um, we're starting to see the gradients disappear as we enter into January. And what you're going to notice is not only does the physical gradient stop, but there, we're just sort of straight lines going into the chlorophyll and the oxygen. I don't know if you, I'm not going to spend the time to replay this, but if you look really closely with the chlorophyll, you see that as it gets into that February overturn, you actually see the signal decreasing as the line flattens. It's getting pushed down. And when we first saw this data, and we saw that everything was flatlining with the profiles, our science partners contacted us and they said, hey, your sensor's broken. It's not working anymore. We have this overturn event. Do you think there's a temperature susceptibility? And we said no, because we're really seeing the same temperature. But we couldn't understand what was going on. And it was only as the signal started to come back in the spring that we realized this was real data. And as we looked more closely to what was happening, we actually saw that before, whoops, before uh, the overturn event, have the stratification, and then after you had chlorophyll at a higher concentration than the minimum was before the event. And so you really saw that this chlorophyll was being pushed into the water. And this is very significant because what you're saying when you see this is that you have particulate organic carbon that's being pulled, ultimately pulled from the atmosphere of CO2 going through photosynthetic processes, and then sinking to the bottom. We're seeing carbon sequestration. We're seeing it actually in near real time. Very significant. The, many of you know Dr. Ian Walsh. He works with Seabird. He is an optics specialist. This is his background. And when he started realizing what was really going on, he actually had to go and say, well, what does that really mean? And so, he did a crude model based on sort of the fluorescence to chlorophyll conversion and efficiency and what we're really talking about, chlorophyll in terms of carbon. He went through this basic equation saying, well, how much carbon did really got removed during that period? And um, over the course of the, in the area that we were measuring, he kind of came out with uh, a result that uh, we removed 50,000 metric tons, or we saw 50,000 metric tons of carbon removed from the atmospheric system 
That's equivalent to gasoline for 30,000 cars. It's tricky. It, it, it's relevant to what goes on. Another example, um, I won't spend as much time on this, but it points out to another point of what good means and how we're getting there with our biogeochemical measurements. And this is involves gliders and so time and space consistency. So in this case, we had uh, a glider observational effort going off the west coast of the United States. This was work done by uh, Mary J. Perry from the University of Maine, Charles Erickson from the University of Washington, uh, others involved with the experiment as well. And they collected this data over the course of five years. Five years of glider data doesn't mean that you have one glider going back and forth over a certain zone for about five years. What it means is that you have multiple gliders going in and out, you're changing out the sensors, you're putting new sensors in, you're really changing the system over and over and having it go back and look at the same water mass over and over again. And what we found is that there were really virtually no corrections other than initial offset corrections that had to be made to get this picture of the seasonal variability over time. Um, you can see sort of when the bloom dynamics happen every year. We had a couple of times where we were missing the data because the players weren't in the water. But you really have five years of continuous data being repeatable multiple sets of sensors. Um, excellent coherence between the different sensors. This is pretty much just saying what I'm saying. Next example, the ISTEP technology. This is the technology that uh, was brought to Seabird uh, via Honeywell, via Inbari, uh, Ken Johnson at Inbari a technology developed for industrial applications and adapted it for measuring uh, pH in seawater. The reason he was attracted to the ISPEC technology in the first place was that it provided a much more stable measurement over time than uh, current other available methods. And it provided a very compact footprint. So it got through initial stage of development the Inbari efforts, and then as time went by, they were passed on to us, and we've taken them over to move them into being standard products available for boats, moorings, and other autonomous platforms. This is a uh, test data. This is our float deployed once again off the coast of Hawaii, and uh, this would include 149 profiles day after day during a daily cycling. And meantime, the hot site has a lot of ongoing ship monitoring, so there were boats going in and out to do comparison relatively close to the site. And you can see that we have good agreement. We have some biasing that we still are trying to address in our original calibrations. Um, the calibrations for the sensor are quite complex. But the key in this really is the stability that we found. Uh, we were going for the stability factor that was sort of passed on to us when we took it on a 0 0.003 TH units per month drift. Um, in actual fact, our drift numbers fell well within that, and we're seeing very low drift from coupled to uh, Argo platforms. This is the Lobo system, sort of the buoys that I we were talking about the initial story of what was going on in Stewart, Florida. Um, these buoys are very well outfitted in terms of biogeochemical sensors. They have various optics. I was showing phosphate data. Um, they have phosphate and nitrate both, as well as chlorophyll and other uh, various biogeochemical measurements. And with the combined SUNA phosphate nitrate data, we can really begin to understand deeper levels of what goes on in triggering loads. Um, certainly the 
amounts of phosphate and nitrate in the water play a role in the blooms. Um, there's, I think people here that are familiar with biology may understand red film ratios where we have um, sort of this certain ratio of phosphate and nitrogen that once exceeded, we tend to find ourselves in uh, great conditions for creating blue green, blue -green algae, which is often related to harmful algal blooms. It's not necessarily, but it's often uh, species or family blooms. This is the system that we're talking about. So we have multiple inputs into a common estuary. Mouth of the estuary is feeding in. This is uh, sort of the basin. This is one of the inputs. This is another. Um, it's a fairly complex system, actually. I think I got that right. Oops. And we look at uh, nutrient dynamics from a couple of the locations. And in the feed locations from the inland sites, we see very high ratios of the nitrate to phosphate. And these are the ratios that are actually where the phosphate or the blue harmful, blue-green algae is actually um, productive. And it's starting to uh, show signs it's capable of growing quite easily. Um, this is out towards the mouth of the bay where you're closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. There, it's not so much a problem. So you can see, once again, through the appropriate signature of the water, you can get a good idea of what to expect. This is an example of would have, could have, wish we would have had. Um, when the condos still happen, the deep water horizon buoy or, or deep hot water horizon uh, oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico, when this uh, event occurred, Unfortunately, there was very little out there to really uh, be measuring the impact of the spill that happened. Um, there were no autonomous systems out there at the time. There were no buoys near the platform. Um, and there were really no sensors that were verified to be able to detect the oil and water. Uh, there were some vicarious uh, research expeditions going on nearby. They took their ships and got closer to the platform. And they started to make measurements. Um, this is one ship that was uh, being used by the University of Southern Mississippi, Texas A&M, Ruth Pepper. And uh, they had a seabird rosette on with various different types of sensors, including a sea bottom barometer. And they started to see some very interesting signatures very strong signatures uh, in the water column. Problem is, is uh, we couldn't really say what those signatures were. We suspected that uh, this elevation showed a big intrusion from the platform spill, but nobody could say that for sure. A lot of the data that was collected from this ship and from other ships was actually given to NOAA. It was not published held quietly for another year, a year and a half, while they went through an evaluation effort to determine what the sensors that were making these measurements were really seeing. And at the end of that evaluation period, it was shown that indeed the sea dawn measurement that was on this platform, some other particulate scattering measurements of dissolved oxygen all of these provided a very good signature of the oil intrusion. And so it was a very useful set of measurements that we understood that we had a year, year and a half after the event. What if we would have been able to take these measurements and make them, have them on autonomous platforms that were nearby the site when it was actually occurring? And that was our goal thereafter to make that capability, and we developed it. Um, we found that despite the fact, or even though the barometer that we had on board to detect the oil, it wasn't a very good sensitive uh, indicator, and we had to improve the sensitivity of the unit. 
So we've done that with this new kind of uh, see how device. We've uh, proved the affecting sensitivity by about seven times. And we hope that as these start to be, this is part of the biogeochemical warning or biogeochemical CTP for the floods. We hope as these are used more routinely, we'll start to be able to capture this type of event as well. Um, the type of sensitivity that we're talking about should allow us to actually detect an oil spill from a five liter per minute leak um, from five or 10 kilometers away. Once again, Ian's work is a hand here, but it shows that these tools could be useful in these episodic events. One more thing, um, I'm going to break away from the biogeochemistry and talk about uh, work that we're doing towards uh, deep measurement of conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, I think some of you are aware of the Barco program that's also in sort of nascent stages. Efforts are underway to have 6,000 meter floods um, sampling the ocean. And in order to do that, we need, in order to capture the variance, good data needs something more than what we have with our CPDs or normal ARGO. Um, this is a test deployment that we decided we've been working with others on uh, that were here, you know, Dean Irving, Silverman, Sutton, Murphy. Um, these were deployed test units deployed in the southern Indian Ocean off the coast of Australia and off the coast of the uh, Pacific in New Zealand. These were the various sample parts. And here's where we stand with this. This is just a quick status for so we can understand where we are. Um, what we have right now is we think we have a CTD that's useful for this type of work other than the 9-11 plus. Um, we have calibration issues that we're still working on. We tend to have a small bias, British bias in our conductivity measurement. So we definitely still aren't quite there. We have uh, solidity scatter of about 20.002 PSUs. So that's approximately an, almost an order of magnitude factor of five that we normally publish in our normal specifications for our um, And we have excellent drift, virtually no drift over time. So we do feel we have a capability that can match the capabilities of the deep cargo platforms with measurements that capture the back block, background variability. I know I've kind of jumped from topic to topic. I appreciate the uh, time today, but there was sort of one message or a set of messages that I was trying to get across as I did this. I think that uh, autonomous platforms and measurements do provide us with a new set of capabilities, and we're just at the beginning really being able to tap these and see the richness of the information that they can provide. Um, the real power with the autonomous platforms ultimately gets back to the data that they can provide. And the data in terms of biogeochemistry is progressing. We still have more work to do. But it's still, it's a work in progress. Um, we do have the new tools that are coming on themselves. They're actually working in the various applications that uh, use these platforms. And uh, I think that's pretty much the story. I, I hope that I provided a little bit of new information for everybody. Thank you. Suppose uh, questions and things like that. Of that kind, we are blaming the carbon. Correct. 
what we call the moral evil. Well, what we saw in that was one, one part of a much larger story. You know, the carbon-ocean interchange is very complex, and it's, a, it's almost a respiration story. But this was one of the first uh, two times in, I've seen so far where we've actually seen the biological uh, content actually move through the ocean column. So is, are we high in our estimations? I don't know. Um, does that mean that that carbon is, I mean, does that mean it's the only transfer mechanism for carbon? Absolutely not. In fact, particular organic carbon is not the most significant component of the carbon transfer cycle. But it does show us that we have a tool that we can measure that part of the equation, if you will. So I think that's a significant uh, finding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question that will be on the right there, C outbreak. What do you get? I'm sorry? C out. What is the principle of operation? Working principle. What is the working principle? Fluorescence. Yes. So it's a UV. Uh, it's a UV fluorescence signal, and we've uh, done an extensive study on this, and we have a set of fluorescence tools that we hope to provide over the next three years. This was the first of that set of tools. And at the wavelengths of the fluorescence emission and the excitation are really uh, set so they see crude oil well. They don't see all oil that well in the water. As uh, oil decays, it sort of bifurcates into tar substances and very light groups. And then the bacteria sort of start to feed on various parts. And you lose that signal fairly quickly. Over the course of three weeks, we found that uh, the sensitivity to the oil from this measurement dropped down by probably an order of magnitude. But for fresh crude, it works very well. Thank you. Now, I have one question. Yes. Uh, what is the nutrient that's Okay, that's a good question. So, the let's start. There are two different, very different instruments. Um, the SUNA instrument is a nitrate measurement. The way it's measuring nitrate is through looking at deconvolving deep UV spectrum, of the spectrophotometric measurement. And so what it's really doing is looking at a curve that's fairly complex where you have a strong uh, slope due to the water itself. You have a slope or a big convolving hump of absorption uh, from bromides in the water. And then you have nitrate, which also has a very strong signature. So what it's doing is taking the nitrate curve out of the rest of that background and providing a quantitative estimate of concentration based on the amplitude of that curve. Uh, ultimately, the way that instrument is calibrated is through spectrographic means where we're using standard spectrophotometer bench top to look at various concentrations of uh, nitrate in the water. There may be some interference associated with nitrite that's still there, and that, that's probably the biggest interference, and then there may be some interference, especially for coastal work, with the CDOM, the background dissolved organic matter. Try to take that out in convolution, but you do have error components. Phosphate uh, measurement, it's an orthophosphate measurement, and it's done really very much mimicking uh, laboratory 
auto analysis techniques where it's a wet chemistry measurement and we're applying a, a reagent to the ambient water, mixing that reagent and looking at the, the phosphate signal. So I would say effectively that's as good as a measurement that you're going to do in the lab. So as you say, the specific ratio, you apply the ratio that is good from the open ocean water. But by coming to the coastal water, so most of the work that's been done with nitrate and phosphate combined has been done in uh, very coastal environments. This is, this is where we have fairly significant signals of both the phosphate and the nitrate uh, signals. So I think the test... <laughs> You know, red field ratios uh, in open oceans are the things that we haven't really been able to quantify. The coastal work is where we're really being able to do that more routinely. As to the veracity and the red field ratio itself and what it tells and what it doesn't, it, it's sort of a rule of thumb. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but it's in effect a rule of thumb sorts and it's an indicator of when you're in ideal conditions for growth rather than an absolute. A uh, question connected with the nitrate measurement. Yes. Uh, when we have nitrate sensors in, uh, near to glacier mills, uh, will the runoff will have any effect in measurement? Will nitrate bias measurements near what? The glacier mills, like we have a moving Arctic. Glacial so will that be uh, So. Um, the, if you're really finding yourself looking at a freshwater system or something like that, um, we have correction methods for looking at fresh water. If you're looking at a system that just has high variability, our nitrate sensor probably does a better job of highly variable waters than anyone out there because it has a good correction for seed on which is sort of the contributor that in freshwater systems that really starts to dominate. Um, the bromide doesn't really factor in too heavily in creating an air churn for when we have freshwater influx to the system. So I think it should work fairly well. So, lots of different environments. Um, we have tested in Mississippi Delta in the United States off various coasts of the United States, Chesapeake Bay, um, various waters in China, uh, East China Sea, uh, the same river in Europe, the Mediterranean, the Irish Sea. These, these instruments have actually seen fairly widespread use at this time, and there are limitations. Um, the biggest limits that we find are in very high turbidity waters, um, notably China, in where we can overwhelm our sensitivity range for scattering, for instance, just simple scattering measurements become uh, in high turbid waters. That starts to introduce air to some of these other measurements. In waters that are classic coastal environments with water, uh, fresh water outflows, we tend to do fairly well as we move up in deeper river basins with highly cetaceous uh, waters. That's where we start to reach our limits. So we can show you different examples from different places. I was showing these examples primarily because of showing the 
slightly different spin they took on our standard views for these different systems of what was going on. Um, the waters where we were looking at in the Florida example with the phosphate nitrate sensors, those are very high turbidity waters for the United States. They, they, I don't know if you're familiar with NTUs as a measurement method for standard turbidity, but we're talking 50, 60 NTU type waters. So they definitely have a lot of uh, stuff in them. Does that make everywhere? No. But I, I don't know quite how to answer. We definitely have found limits, but we've done a lot of work in coastal environments around the world and where we are at that true coastal margin, sort of that one percent salinity barrier to total uh, ocean level salinity, we find we do fairly well as a typical rule. is so good. <laughs> uh, so first to the fouling question. Um, I think we felt like we had really done a lot with fouling over the last six, seven years. Um, we have methods associated with our CTD that work very well. Um, they keep the the sampling chamber clean over fairly long periods of time. Um, with Argo mission, of course, the Argo mission was very affirming to us. Boy, we can we can go for years and we're good. And then I come visit today and I look at pictures of recent buoys that you pulled out of the water uh, off the west coast of India, and they're encrusted with uh, various uh, shellfish. It's it's a mess. And so we clearly have a long way to go. And I think that where we stand is that our immediate, we've done a good job with our immediate sample volumes and keeping them clean. But we really haven't addressed the fouling problem from a more holistic point of view, where we really try to make the whole package where it stays free of fouling. Um, we were talking about that earlier today. I think that's really where you need to go if you're going to get one year and beyond durations in your moored applications going forward. So that's where we're going to focus our efforts is being able to sort of develop a package that can be put in biologically active water for a year or longer. Um, we think there's ways at that, but it's not the way we're doing it now, copper, copper wrapping is not going to be good enough to make that happen. So we have to move beyond that. We have to incorporate UV. We have to incorporate the shape and the surface of the package itself to improve that. To the second question, uh, I that's really an unfair question because I'm biased and I, I have my own point of view, and of course I'm happy to brag. But I, I do feel that when I think of the people that work at Seabird, the passion that they have for what they're doing, I mean, almost every one of those people could be probably making more money somewhere else, could be doing something that's a, a much more mainstream type of industry or application. But they do it because they like being there. They like doing what they do. And I think as they 
stay and they address some of the failures that we have. Um, they see some of the packages that come back and didn't work. They, they see uh, things that really we didn't do well. I think that learning really drives us to say, what can we do next? And we actually follow through pretty well on making that next step in evolution. So it's a lot of passion, and it's a lot of the fact that we've stuck around and we're still here and we're still Thank you.